Okay, so here is the energy profile of these conformations. A little bit different, but similar. All right, same type of thing. So you have your total eclipsed, where the two methyl groups are completely eclipsing each other. Highest energy. I mean, look at that, 21 kilojoules, because eventually w we get down to 3.8. So uh, that's a lot. Again, don't worry about numbers. It's just more of a reference just to kind of show you that we're, we're talking about quite a bit of energy here. Okay, so pretty much butane does not exist in this conformation. Okay, and then you have a Gaussian interaction. Okay, and you see it comes down in energy. Again, this refers to this. All right, and then you go back up to eclipsing. See how it goes back up in energy. Then finally, you get the anti conformation. So if you notice, the Gauche and the anti aren't that far away from each other in energy wise. Okay. I mean, uh, like in comparison to how far it is away from here to here, I mean, obviously, it's still higher in energy, but you can see that just by doing that alleviates quite a bit of energy and, uh, quite, and qu quite a bit of that steric strain, okay? All right, um, so steric strain, again, we'll talk, uh, again, here's the thing where you have the two methyl groups. You see how you have the methyl groups hitting each other, all right? Here, th th they kind of are giving you a better example of it. Now, you, you technically have a little bit on the hydrogens. It's not as big as you have here because not only the carbons interacting, it's hard to see the carbons. You see on the space filling, it's easier to see. It's easier to see. You see how this big, this big blob of a carbon, remember, is right here, and then the other carbon is right here. I mean, uh, th those carbons are hitting each other. Plus, now the hydrogens are interacting. So you really got a lot of, a lot of trouble here. Okay? So, um, that's kind of what's referred to steric strain when you have the total eclipse conformation is higher in energy because it forces the two methyl groups so close to each other that, that the electron clouds experience a strong repulsion. All right, this kind of strain between two bulky groups is called steric strain or steric hindrance. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about cycloalkanes. Now um, we are going to actually be doing lab um, this week and uh, one of the labs is we're going to be doing a um, kind of like an activity where we make the models and you're able to see all these Newman projections and uh, you kind of answer questions. So if it's a little confusing um, you definitely will get more of it when we do the lab. Alright, cyclical alkanes. General formula is as you can see at the top CnH2n Remember, if it was a straight chain, it was 2n plus 2. But cyclicals is you take away two hydrogens because you close up that ring. All right. Um, so the smallest ring, obviously, is a three-membered ring because you can't make a cyclical structure with only two carbons. So uh, cyclopropane um, is the smallest chain, as we can see right here, C3H6, cyclopropane. That's the name of it, cyclopropane. It's a propane because it's... An alkane, three carbons, but it's a cyclical structure. So that's how you're going to name these. Cyclobutane, pentane, hexane, uh, cycloheptane. Um, you can have cyclooctane, cyclonanane, so forth and so on. These are kind of the most common ones. The most common are the five and the six membered rings. These right here, cyclopentane and especially cyclohexane. What we're going to talk about the... Um, uh, the structures of these, just like how we did with Newman projections, because there's some interesting things that goes on w with these molecules. Some physical properties, nonpolar, I think you could have figured that out. Um, relatively inert. Um, inert as, in, as far as chemical reactivity. They do, if you light them with fire, they will explode. All right, They will ignite, but as far as reactivity, nothing too exciting. Okay. Boiling points and melting points, again, depend on the size of the molecule. More interactions, uh, more planar the molecule gets, the higher the boiling points. Okay, So you can kind of see as the molecule is getting bigger, you're getting much larger uh, boiling points um, and um, because of the uh, intermolecular forces. Nomenclature. Let's go to nomenclature first. Very straightforward. The, your parent compound is your cyclical compound. Not always, but most cases. I don't know if the slides will talk about when it's not. If it doesn't, remind me and I will talk about it in class. All right. So this is my parent. So this is a cyclopentane. Okay. And I have an ethyl group. So this is called ethyl cyclopentane. Nothing too hard here. All right. 
that's the main chain. Alkyl groups attached to the cyclo. Uh, alkane will be named as the alkyl group. If only one alkyl group is present, there's no ne there's no need for a number. I don't have to put one ethyl cyclopentane because there's only one group on there. I don't have to distinguish between where on the ring it is because it's the only group. Um, and yeah. get mine out of there just to show you. Ethyl cyclopentane. Okay. If there are two or more substituents, number the main chain to give all substituents the lowest possible numbers. Okay, so what does that mean? Let's look at this one. We have two groups. There's lots of ways of counting this. I can count it one, two, three, or one, two, three, four, five. If I count this way, my su substituents are at the car one carbon and the three carbon. If I count the other way, it's at the one carbon and the five carbon. I want my numbers to be the lowest. So that's why I'm going to do 1, 3. So this is called, I'm sure they give you the names, but in case they don't, 1, 3, dimethyl cyclohexane. I'm writing small because I want to fit it in there. Okay, what happens if you have lots of different groups? Okay, notice I have two of them on one carbon and one of them on the other. Okay, so... Uh, the ways to do it is I can go one, two, three. Therefore, this would be called, I would have a group at one, and then I would have two groups at three. So r remember, I have a diethyl, so that would be like a three, three diethyl, is how, I'm sorry, dimethyl. This group is ethyl. Ethyl. Okay? Or I can name this carbon one, and this carbon two, and this carbon three. Now it's called 1,1-dimethyl-3-ethyl. That's actually lower numbering because the majority of my numbers are smaller. Rather than 1,3,3, three, three, I'll have 1,1,3. One, one, so 1,1-dimethyl, one, one, dimethyl, and then I would have a 3-ethyl. So this is the way I'm going to number it. All right. So like we said, 1,3-dimethyl-cyclohexane. And there we go, 3-ethyl-1-1-dimethylcyclohexane. So we number it. Let me get this out of the way here so you can see how they number it. They number it this way. Okay, not this way. So 3-ethyl, remember, the reason the ethyl is going first is because it becomes al it's alphabetically before the M. Remember, D is not used alphabetically. Okay. Uh, let me go back to this and see one. Let's say we have this molecule. Let's say we have an ethyl group here and just one methyl group here. Okay, I have an ethyl here and a methyl here. I just have one. Okay, two possibilities. I can number it one, two, three, or number it one, two, three. Okay, so which way am I going to number it? In this case, because you have one of each, you number it alphabetically. Since ethyl alphabetically is before methyl, I'm going to methyl, that E shouldn't be there. Methyl, I'm going to start counting this way. One, two, three. So the name of this is 1-ethyl, 2-methyl. Sorry for the sloppy handwriting. This thing is very hard to draw on. Cyclohexane. Okay? So you kind of have three possible scenarios here. Always go with the lowest. If they're equal and you have one of each, go alphabetically. If you have more than one, don't go alphabetically. You go by the lowest numbering, lowest possible, num possible numbering. Students accidentally draw cyclical structures when acyclical structures are intended and vice versa. Always verify whether the name contains a prefix cyclo. This is absolutely true. Okay, A lot of times people forget the word cyclo or they should do a cyclo and they do a straight or they do a straight and do a cyclo. So make sure... You remember there are two different types of alkanes, cyclical and non-cyclical, or acyclical. Okay, cycloalkanes as substituents. Oh, so they do have this. Okay, you do not have to remind me about if it's not a substituent because here it is. All right, uh, the cycloalkane becomes a substituent when a, when a acyclical portion of the molecule contains fewer carbons and when there is more important functional groups in the molecule. All right, this is... I'm going to show you a different way of naming this than what your book does. I don't like how your book does this. Most of this is correct, but I'm going to change it. Okay? I'm actually going to scratch this out right here. Okay, and I'm going to change this. It's not necessarily fewer carbons. It's more complicated group. A more complicated group. Now, if this does get confusing, 
please ask me in class. That's the point of coming to that class. Complicated. All right. I'm trying to get all the information here. Maybe you, you'll understand it, but if you don't, we'll talk about it in class. All right. That's when you ask questions. So it's really when the group hanging off of your cyclical part is more complicated, then, like, this is the example. This is a very complicated group. There is no quick way of naming this. This I can name a methyl. This I name tert-butyl. Very easy to actually name this. That's tert-butyl. So tert-butyl cycloheptane, no problem. Methyl cycloheptane. But this does not have a name. This does not have a easy name. This is one, two, three, four, five. It's five carbons. It's some sort of a pentane. All right. I don't know any easy name for this group. So in that case, this is my parent. My parent here is this longest chain. One, two, three, four. Okay. So this is my longest chain right here. These four carbons. This is now my parent chain. Okay. And this is a substituent. And this is a substituent. Okay, so I, I, I've completely, in this case, here is my parent, my cycloheptane, because I can easily name that. This is my, I'm squaring all of the parents and circling all the substituents, and here is m my substituent. But in this case, this is my parent chain. I'm going to number it starting here. One, two, three, four. The reason is because cyclohexyl comes before methyl, because in this case, we use the C. So the C is used, not the hexyl. This is methyl. Okay, so this would be called, ignore how your book has you do it. This is a much more complicated way, and it's not really done that often. The way I'm teaching you is the more common way. So this would be 2 cyclohexyl 3 methyl butane. Okay, 3 cyclohexyl 2 methyl butane. Because I have a butane, here's my 4 carbon butane, and I have a cyclohexyl hanging off of it, and I have a methyl hanging off of it. Okay, what, so when the group, so if you, if you want to read this, a cycloalkane becomes a substituent when the acyclical portion of the molecule is a more complicated group. is a more complicated group than the cyclical part and when there is a more important functional group in the molecule. Okay? See if you, this makes sense. Otherwise, we'll talk about it in class. Geometric isomers. We do not have rotation around these bonds on the rings. Rings do not rotate. These bonds do not rotate. They are fixed. So because of that, we have what's called geometric isomers or something called stereoisomers. Stereoisomers is basically it's the same molecule. They are connected in the same place, but they differ in three dimensions. Okay? Notice that these methyl groups are on the same side. I could have also drawn this molecule where the methyls are on opposite sides. They're kind of showing you here, but you have an ethyl group. Okay? So let me show you the alternative for this dimethyl compound you would have a CH3 here and a CH3 that's going back into the plane. Another way of showing this is a side-on view. Let me see if I can do this. Where one of the CH3s is coming up and the other CH3 is coming down. Notice they are opposite of each other. That's called the trans conformation. These both are the trans. It's the same thing. This is called the cis, where they're on the same side. So a side-on view of that would look like this. Now, some people can see in, th in three dimensions. Other people have a hard time seeing in three dimensions. That's why I let you have the model set so that you don't have to worry about it. Okay? So, this is the cis conformation. Whenever the two groups are opposite of each other, they're called trans, opposite sides. Okay? When, so, this molecule is called, and I don't think I have the name, so let me erase all that. The name of this is called cis 1 2 dimethylcyclohexane. The trans molecule would be called trans 1 2 dimethylcyclohexane. So that's what this would be called. This one would be called trans 1-ethyl 2-methyl cyclohexane. All right? Trans 1-ethyl 2-methyl cyclohexane. Okay? I'm going to put it on pause here because I'm going to need pretty much the next whole video to talk about stabilities of alkanes. So I'll see you on the next video.